Neil Gaiman's Dark Dream of the Endless has been a popular Sandman comic for almost three decades. It's a great comic for getting new readers interested in comics, and more people will read The Sandman if it is accessible on Netflix. Prospective readers should understand a few essential differences between the graphic books and the television program. What makes them distinct? Comic book adaptations often, and sometimes drastically, change the original material. Here is what we know so far regarding their differences. To begin with, the Corinthians has been a part of the production from the very start. The book, The Doll's House, was the first to employ the Corinthian style. The fact that the nightmare was defeated is a subsidiary plot detail, yet it is critical to the story. The show gives him more of a plot arc from the very first episode. Roderick Burgess prevents Morpheus from returning the Corinthian to the Dreaming when the audience first sees him. Morpheus was going to return the Corinthian with the Dreaming. Readers who buy the original edition of The Sandman, Preludes, and Nocturnes expecting to discover the Corinthian will be disappointed. The circumstances leading up to Morpheus's capture are chronicled in the prequel book, The Sandman Overture. Nevertheless, the television show interprets even this predicament differently. Moving on, regardless of gender or race, several characters were cast. Despite its high proportion of white characters, The Sandman was the most progressive comic book of its time. Most of the characters were of Caucasian heritage, and except for destruction, all of the endless were white. Another trait that distinguishes the historical period is is that most characters are heterosexual guys. This metamorphosis came about through the Netflix service. Several characters were shown as white in the comics, but have subsequently been transformed, including Lucian and Rose Walker. There are many openly LGBT individuals, and both Lucian and Lucifer are played by female performers. These changes are a welcome continuation of Gaiman's attempts to make the Sandman comic seem like the world he lived in, which is why they were produced in the first place. Unlike in the comics, the dreaming never changes. The endless all wield enormous power, and their realms are an extension of both themselves and the tasks they undertake. This helps to explain, in part, why the Dreaming transforms into a desolate scene while Dream is imprisoned. He makes unconscious changes to the Dreaming, and it adjusts to his will. One of the most intriguing aspects of the setting is that the Dreaming in the comics is always different whenever readers visit it. Dreams are mutable entities that change when they are analyzed in any way, in contrast to how it appears in the comics, which are more like recurring dreams in which details are subtly altered each time. The layout of Dream's castle never changes from episode to episode of the television series. Next up, Johanna Constantine is not like John Constantine. The character of Johanna Constantine, portrayed by Jenna Coleman, is one of the show's centerpieces. Nonetheless, she differs significantly from John Constantine. John is a jerk, but in a good way. Even when attempting to help others, he's always looking for something for himself. These disparities are presented to the audience via Coleman's performance, distinguishing her identity identity from the comic books. Johanna's character is introduced in the show's first episode, but prior knowledge of Constantine is required for the comic. In many ways, Coleman's version of Constantine makes the character more compelling than the one seen in comic books. Moving on, in the comic, the duel in hell is much different. A Hope in Hell is the title of one of the most remembered parts of the Sandman. Gwendolyn Christie is fantastic as Lucifer, and she completely dominates every scene in which she appears. This episode adapts the storyline of the Sandman number Four, written by Neil Gaiman, Sam Keith, Mike Drigenberg, Robbie Bush, and Todd Klein. Nevertheless, the episode makes several fairly major changes to the narrative. The fight for Dream's helmet is the most major new addition. In the comic, Dream and Karanzan get caught in the thick of a battle at a nightclub. Even if seeing more of Christie is a wonderful part of the change, it does pave the way for a clash between Dream and Lucifer. This plot twist will be a great shock to anyone who has read the comic. Following that, the larger DC universe is almost completely removed from Netflix. The Sandman comic book series evolved significantly over its run, notably when Vertigo published it. Despite this, the plot takes place after the events of Crisis in the DC Universe. Wesley Dodd is motivated to become the first Golden Age Sandman due to the drowsiness caused by Dream's absence. In the comics, Etrigan the Demon leads Morpheus through Hell, while John Dee plays Dr. Destiny, a Justice League enemy imprisoned in Arkham. Hector and Lita Hall formerly worked for Infinity Inc. as Silver Scarab and the Fury. Hector takes up the role of Sandman in Jeb's Nightmares. This is the only time the episode illuminates DC Comics characters or themes. In the show, Ethel Cripps has a lot more to do. Ethel Cripps has a different role in the television production of The Sandman than she does in the novels. If you read The Sandman first, you'll note that Ethel plays a far greater part right from the start. In The Sandman comics, Ethel is more of a supporting character. She flees with Mr. Sykes rather than alone, and isn't seen again until she pays a visit to John in Arkham. Throughout 
the series. Her personality is examined in more detail. There are ties between Ethel and other prominent people, like Roderick Burgess and John Dee. Her decisions impact Dream's destiny more, such as when she bargained with a demon in return for a powerful amulet. She has a greater influence over Dream's fates. Moving on, the show steals horror from the most terrifying parts of the comics. The Sandman is an excellent example of a horror comic. Two of the most horrific story arcs from the comic book were adapted for the show's first season, 24 Hours, and Collectors were the titles. Fans will remember these issues as the ones that established the book's legitimacy in the horror genre, even though the comic would branch out outside of the horror genre. However, the adaptations of such comics into the episodes, 24-7 and Collectors, are not at all terrifying. The focus in 24-7 is more on the sexual components of the story than on expressing the misery of what is happening. Collectors quickly reveals its secrets to viewers and loses its edge when Gaiman's novel and Dringenberg's spooky images are removed. Following that, the show ignores The Sandman number 9. The Dream is a complex comic book character since he has gone through a lot in his long life and has done some awful things. The episode A Hope in Hell with Nada teases this, while Tales in the Sand, featured in The Sandman issue number 9, expands on it. This novella, written by Gaiman, Mike Dringenberg, Malcolm Jones III, Robbie Bush, and Todd Klein, depicts the tragic relationship between Dream and Nada. The principal issue of The Doll's House, which is located at the beginning of the book, is the manipulation of Dream by Desire. It was likely left out of the Netflix version, since the streaming service plans to adapt Season of Mists in the next season. But the fact that it was left out resulted in a dramatic change from the book to the screen adaptation. Next up, the first season concludes with a clear setup for Seasons of Mist. The Sandman comics are jam-packed with fascinating storylines. The fourth book in the series, Season of Mists, is a favorite because it digs into Dream's voyage to hell and explains Lucifer's wrath against Morpheus. Gaiman pushed it to the fourth story because he didn't want the book to grow like X-Men by making Morpheus more of a superhero-like character. As High Bender explains in The Sandman Companion, one of the reasons Gaiman chose it as the fourth tale is because of this. The show's first season concludes with Lucifer swearing revenge on Morpheus in front of an amassed army of Hell's demons. It's an incredible moment that offers Christie's Lucifer another chance to shine. But it's not what occurred in the comic, and it seems to be the actions of an old-school comic book bad guy. Finally, Dream has been imprisoned for over a century and is extending the lives of his jailers. Dream of the Endless was imprisoned for more than seven decades in the first series of Sandman comics from 1916 to 1988. In the Netflix rendition of The Sandman, the time Dream is imprisoned is prolonged by three decades. Dream eventually gets free in 2021, five years and a century after Roderick Burgess initially imprisoned him, according to this narrative version, even though Dream is an ancient entity that is everlasting in all intents and purposes. The increased timescale makes imprisoning him very impossible for any mortal being. To explain this, the Netflix show demonstrates that the presence of Dream increases the lives of mortals in close contact with them. Well, that marks the end of our show for today. We hope you liked it. On your way out, make sure to hit that subscribe button for more content like this in the future. Thanks for watching.